Today, Lord, I pray that the words that we have read this morning, the words that we heard in the beginning of the, the service from your gospel, will find a resting place within our hearts, within our souls, and will renew us, will strengthen us, and will prepare us for the journey of the days ahead. And so, Lord, I pray this morning that you would speak, that you would set aside our own thoughts, our own ideas, and that instead we would be filled with your words, with your wise counsel. This morning, Lord, I pray that we are ready to hear it, that our ears, our hearts, our minds, and our souls are open to receive every word that you say to us this morning. Speak to us, O oh Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. I've, I've shared, I think, every year since I've been here, and I, even before that, I love Palm Sunday. It's like one of my favorites. Because, you know, I used to think as a, as a young kid, when you went into church, they gave you these cool um, palm leaves. We used to get, and there's some back there, if you haven't got them today, make sure that you get them. Uh, the, I call them the spiky palms that are the prawn palms. But, um, you know, I can remember they would give them to us, and then, you know, we would go to our Sunday school class, and we would make them into crosses so that we could display them in, in our room but, uh, or in our home and to signify that we would put these palms in. But this is what I like best about Palm Sunday. And I don't know that we ever get too old to do that, do we? You know, and, and we try to do it sort of like sometimes that we would just like touch and see if they think it's a bug on their back and that they can touch, you know. It just, you know, it becomes that, that fun part. I learned something new about Palm Sunday and Palm Waving this week. Um, not actually this week, in the, in the last couple of months. Um, in Scripture, uh, what I was, you know, always thought to believe that this was just a custom that the people who saw Jesus triumphantly come in would rip down these palm branches just to wave them to get attention for them. But as I studied into Scripture, I learned in, in the Old Testament that waving of palm branches were a sign that victory had happened, that when the armies would return, that the people would stand and would wave palm branches. But I also learned something else really, really important. The actual act of waving palm branches is only mentioned in two instances in Scripture. One of them, of course, is mentioned in three of the Gospels, not in all four of them, but in three of the Gospels. Whereas Jesus came back into Jerusalem, they laid cloaks on the, on the ground as a, a sign that the, the honor of the victor would not have to touch dirt, that they would wave these palm branches as a sign of victory. We have won. And it's interesting that the other place that the actual act of waving palm branches is in the Scripture that we read this morning. Now, if you can find other places, not that just talks about why palm branches are waved, but the actual act of waving palm branches, please let me know because I would like to correct that. And I posed that question to a couple people who I consider to be Bible scholars, and no one really came back with another answer. So I'm going to stand on that today. The act of waving palm branches is a sign of victory. As we were studying a few weeks ago in our Bible study, as, as we continue to go through Revelations, we came, I came, the group came upon these words that you just read, 
in the prophecies that, that was given to John, the, the vivid imagery about the second coming of Christ and, and what would take place. And here it is, after this I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. And crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Who are these people that were gathered around the throne in white robes? Sometimes we might think that it was the disciples or the apostles or those dedicated followers. No, in, in closer look, those who would be called to gather around the throne were those who put on the fullness of Christ, who, who put on the everything in Christ, and didn't just pick certain pieces or parts that, that suited them, but that had fully immersed themselves in God, in, in Christ, and, and would be clothed in that white. There, there's even reference that the, the robes would become white after being washed in the blood of Christ. That, that there would be purity, that there would be forgiveness found, that there would be renewal of life. But it also was a no turning back. It, it was a commitment that we made to, to move forward with Jesus, and there could be no turning back, there could be no pausing. And I fear, I fear, I fear, I fear in my own life. I fear in the lives of our churches today, um, in, the, in the lives of our nation, and in the lives of our world, we pause our faith at certain instances so that we can have that faith in Christ to, to mean what we want it to say and not actually what it does say. And so then we get these stains on these white robes that, this purity of Christ that we're called to, to show and to display. And, and so it, it calls us to live this, this more sincere, this, this more powerful life in Christ. Making Christ our everything. And, and so I guess I want to ask this morning, have you made Christ your everything? Would you be counted as one of those in end times, in this end time theology that would be one wearing the white robe? Or would you be one, as Revelation describes, would be set apart as the chaff is separated from the wheat. And so, I think it, it is important that we consider our faith, that, that we consider where we are in our faith, knowing what, what Scripture says, that the only way to the Father is through the Son, is through accepting Jesus Christ and knowing Jesus Christ is our Savior, but it just doesn't end there it then means we have to move forward in our faith. That, that we have to put on the fullness of Christ. And, and understand that when we do that, there is also protection for us. And as we pause to think, that is really, really, really going to be the only thing, the only thing that will make us victorious. It won't matter at the end how much money we've had, how much stuff we've had, how many friends we've had. It, it, it won't matter if we have spent our time trying to prove we are right. What will matter is that we have put on the fullness of Christ. 
that is what the perfect world will look like. Not what we exclude or add to in our faith, but the fullness of Christ. And, and so it calls us to be victorious. It calls us to be victorious in Jesus, in, in, in following after Jesus, in, in being able to not only receive the hope that Jesus offers, but to share that hope with others. It begins in knowing, as Scripture tells us, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. It begins in, in knowing that because God loved each of us so much that He knew that we would horribly mess up, that we would make mistakes, and that in that God sent Jesus into the world to save us, to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. And by the way, that is also a definition of grace of grace coming into our lives and, and filling us. And so, waving the palm branches is more, is so, so much more than just something that we do once a year. It's being reminded of every act, every part of worship that we will engage in, not just in this week, but in every day. Knowing that Christ invites all to the table, that all are welcome, and that even around that table was the one who would betray, the one who would run, the one who would doubt. To be reminded and to know that as Christ prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, we can almost think He had doubts too, but yet He prayed, Thy will be done. And as I have asked you before and as I have said before, are you praying, Thy will be done? Or are you praying, My will be done? There's a big difference. We think about the, the, the silence of the days between Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday. It's time for us to, to reflect and to think about all that Christ has done for us, but more importantly to think now what we what we can do for Christ. And there should never be any misgivings about that relationship. There should never be any doubts about who we will wave those palm branches in victory for. And I hope it's not just something that we do once a year, but that every day, every day that we stand ready to claim victory for Christ, for the one who gives us eternal life, for the one who offers us the best life in the here and the now, who meets our needs, maybe not our wants, who meets our needs and who is always ready to hear and to respond to us. I don't know about you, friends, but that's something to claim victory for. It seems we spend our life in trying to build up things that can't be taken from us, only to find that um, it can be only to find that by some human tragedy or some human occurrence or some worldly thing, most everything we have could be taken from us. But the one thing that cannot be taken from us is that which we have been given because of Jesus Christ's life and death, resurrection, 
through the power of the Holy Spirit living and moving in us. That is truly what can't be taken with us. Everything else can crumble and fall. But the love of God and honoring that love of God is something that will truly give us victory. We're all called every day, almost every moment, to find forgiveness because we are sinners and because we're going to mess up find forgiveness from God, to find forgiveness from those whom we have harmed. And that's what makes that way much easier. So this morning as we go to our closing time of uh, our hymn and our worship, if there's something that has spoke to you this morning and that you want to be prayed for, or that you want to join in prayer, or maybe you just want to come to the, to the altar and um, pray by yourself. 